Many of you know Sue Ann Egan, who shared part of her story in the video. You know the story of her life and Rich and her family. Sue Ann has served here on our church staff for many years, a dear friend to many of us, and I had the very great privilege of being with them that day, shortly after Rich passed away in the hospital room with her and her family and friends. And I can also say that the Lord's presence was with them, with us, on that day. Well, Thanksgiving has come and gone. Remember Thanksgiving is the day right before Black Friday? You know, we have in our culture. And so now we're all plunged headlong into the cultural tsunami that is the holiday season. And I'm not just talking about the lights. How many of you put your Christmas lights up already? Anybody? Well, this is a family out in Elburn, the Larson home out in Elburn. How many of you have been out there to see that house? Right, over a million lights on that house. Not sure I'm going to get to a million, but going to put up a few lights. I'm not talking about the relentless holiday music we hear in the stores and shopping centers around our area. Did you see um, the little report that came out last week by uh, some uh, clinical psychologist that believes that constant exposure to Christian music, uh, to Christian, uh, excuse me, Christmas music is actually bad for your health? <laughs> she did research and thinks it creates uh, stress, an unhealthy mental uh, situation. I mean, how many times can you hear Bing Crosby sing White Christmas, you know? I'm not talking about the endless reruns of classic Christmas movies, It's a Wonderful Life, personal favorite, A Christmas Story, or Home Alone, one, two, three, four, or five. Did you know there's five of them? I had no idea there's five of those. I'm talking about the car commercials. You know, the car commercials, where a brand new Lexus shows up in the driveway with a great big red bow on it. I mean, who does that? Any of you given a Lexus to somebody in your family? Just share it with us. We won't tell. Actually, did you know the Lexus company reported last December, December of 2016, that they sold 41,000 Lexus automobiles in December alone last year? Did you know there's a company that makes only those giant red bows? <laughs> it's true. There's at least one. There might be two. There's one in Pennsylvania called, get this, the Car Bow Store. <laughs> they sell 25,000 of those every year. So some people do that. Well, it's Christmas season, the season of promise. It's the promise of good cheer, culturally speaking. It's the promise of a break from the relentless stream of bad news we seem to get through mainstream media. It's the promise of fun and family and good food and maybe, just maybe, a new car in the driveway. But promise creates expectation. The church has used the word Advent for centuries to celebrate this time of year. Advent is a word that means arrival or coming into view. It's a season of expectation. And today we begin our Advent sermon series, and it's called simply With. With. And the story of with begins with a promise. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1 today and bounce back then to look at the Old Testament. But Matthew chapter 1 beginning in verse 18. Listen to the story. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. I'm going to pause here just for a moment. Sometimes I think, uh, especially this time of the year, that we have become so familiar with this story in particular, that we really, we really struggle to hear it for the story it actually is. I've often said, and Jeff and I have talked about this, that uh, Christmas is, the season is one of the best times to do what we do, to preach the Word of God. It's also one of the hardest times to do this. It's great because the story of Christ coming into the world, of God taking on flesh, is right at the center of the story of the gospel. So it's a great time to preach. I mean, who wouldn't love to do this? On the other hand, it's hard. Because it's one of those times during the year when everybody knows what you're going to say before you say it. You know, blah, 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 blah. Jesus was born, let's go open presents. Right? That's, that's what everybody hears. At least that's what you fear that they hear. But I want us to try to listen just one more time to how un- Christmassy, the Christmas story actually is. Mary and Joseph, a young couple who are betrothed. That's the, the word in ancient Jewish culture for engagement. A little bit different, but similar to our engagement. Mary is a young girl, probably in that culture, just 13, 14 years old or so. And she's found to be with 
child. Now, there's nothing quaint or cute about this part of the story. The word shame is actually in the story. It's a scandal. Their families were being publicly shamed. You didn't do that in ancient Israel. This is more like a nightmare for Joseph. I mean, Nazareth, the small town where they lived, was a, was a tiny town, much smaller than the towns we live in today, maybe a few hundred people. And in small towns, people know and people talk. You don't have to have much of an imagination to, to understand what was happening and what people were saying in that small town. Have you heard? Did you hear? Did you see? I remember he's expecting. I heard that Joseph's not even the father. <laughs> Who could ever believe she would do something like that? He's such a good man. Who would ever imagine? We live in a world full of gossip columns and tabloid headlines. But you know, the truth is, human beings haven't changed much in 2,000 years. Technology changes, but human beings don't change that much. There was a lot of talk going on, a lot of in innuendo, a lot of accusation. Joseph had to have heard the whispers. He saw how people turned their heads and turned away. He knows his life is turned upside down. He's got to find a way out of this mess. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So right in the midst of this broken, stress-filled, messed-up story comes a promise, a promise that actually is in three parts. We'll look at them today. First, we see the promise of a son. There's the promise of a son. I don't think it's an overstatement. I think each of the sets of parents that were up here this morning would agree. It's not an overstatement to say that the birth of a child holds a kind of infinite promise. From the moment a husband and wife discover they're going to be parents, from the morning sickness to the 40 weeks of expectation and dreaming to picking a name to decorating a nursery, all those things. From the moment that child enters the world, usually kicking and screaming, there's promise. Every child brings promise. The doctor who helped my wife deliver three of our four sons is a friend of ours. We've known him through the church for over 25 years now. And when our youngest son was born, the last one, uh, I'll never forget the moment of his birth. Actually, the few moments right before his birth. Um, my wife was tired. It had been a long process. Our doctor, Dr. James Lee, was, was there helping us, and there was a moment of crisis. There was a complication right, right toward the end of the process, and we became concerned that the baby was under great stress. I didn't know what to do. I felt helpless, scared, fearful, but the doctor knew what to do. James knew what to do. And the baby was born healthy, and I was weeping. My wife's weeping because you can't help it. You just are. And then our doctor turned around, a doctor who has delivered thousands of babies, thousands. He looked up at me, and he was weeping. Tears rolling down his cheeks. He said, every one is a miracle. Every one is a miracle. And that's true. It's true in this great story as well. Joseph's in a bad place. His fiance is expecting a child he knows is not his. He's trying to figure out how to separate himself from the whole mess without ruining Mary's life because he cares about her. And then he receives a promise. A promise from God, the promise of a son, but not just a son, a son who is a miracle, a son who is from God. Verse 20, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Years ago, a uh, well-known talk show host, Larry King, was a guest on the David Letterman show late at night. And Letterman, in the course of the interview, said, uh, Larry, if you could interview anyone from human history, who would you want to interview? And he said, I'd like to interview Jesus Christ. And Letterman was kind of surprised, shocked really, and said, well, what would you ask him? And he said, I want to ask him 
if he was indeed virgin born. Because if that's true, he, Larry King said, it would define all of human history for me. He was right. Now there are many who prefer, even people who, who do what Jeff and I do, preach the Bible, many who would like to sort of avoid or jump over this part of the story. I mean, it's kind of weird. It's a little uncomfortable. After all, it's not really necessary to the whole story, is it? Let's just get on to the cross and the resurrection, right? So why not just skip over the claim of virgin birth? There are plenty who claim that the virgin birth story is evidence that the story of Jesus, the whole story, is nothing but fabricated religious mythology. I mean, who could possibly believe this part of the story? And yet, we do. Why is it so important? Let me give you two reasons. There's probably many, but let me just give you two today. First of all, because it's true. We talk about it. Don't skip over it because it's true. We know that from later, later in the New Testament, the Gospel of John in particular, we know that the rumors and insinuations of Jesus' birth followed him all the way through his life, even into his public ministry. In John chapter 8, Jesus is debating with some religious scholars about their relationship to Abraham, their father Abraham. And he challenges their relationship to Abraham. And they say back to him, well, at least we weren't born illegitimately. So even when he was 30, 31, 32 years old, they are still coming at him with the same charges. We don't even know who your father was. So why would anyone have invented the story of virgin birth if it were going to be a scandal that follows him throughout his life? Why would you invent that? Unless it was true. Secondly, we talk about it because it's necessary. It was necessary to God's plan. If the problem of human sin is what the Bible says it is, we'll talk about sin in just a moment. If the religious system of ritual sacrifice was insufficient, and if you were with us the last couple of months, you know we talked all the way through the book of Hebrews, telling us that all those ancient sacrifices just led up to a final sacrifice, that they were insufficient the blood of animals was insufficient to cover and redeem human sin. If that's so, then God was going to have to provide a different, better sacrifice. By his own flesh, by his own blood. So Matthew's making it clear right off the bat that this is no ordinary son. Mary is with child by the Holy Spirit of God, and therefore the child she carries is God himself. One theologian put it this way, the incarnation of Jesus is the central fact of Christianity. The whole of Christianity is predicated on the fact that Jesus is God in human flesh, and that's made clear at the very birth of Christ. But how can we believe such a crazy claim? Let me give you again two reasons. The simplest reason to believe that this is true is that if the Bible begins way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, by saying God created the heavens and the earth by speaking them into existence. He creates out of nothing everything that exists. And if later in the Bible, in the Gospels, it tells us that God raised Jesus from the dead, then virgin birth is really small potatoes compared to those things, right? But if you need a little bit more, if you still have questions, you wrestle with these sorts of things, maybe think about it this way. In 1978, the world's first so-called test tube baby was born, a woman named Louise Brown in Great Britain. Today, we call the whole process in vitro fertilization, IVF, a kind of miraculous medical process by which a baby is conceived without a mother and father ever even needing to touch each other. Today, some 70,000 children are born by IVF in the U.S. alone every year. So to me, it really comes down to a question of technology. Right? So if we believe in a God who is able to create everything from nothing and able to raise the dead, we're, we're talking about a God who is not limited in his technology. So yes, this story is a scandal. The story of virgin birth is a scandal, but not a scandal of immorality. It's a scandal that God has done something unimaginable, is doing something outrageous and scandalous, that God is coming in human flesh and doing so through the promise of a son. That's the first promise. 
There's a second promise. This one is that Jesus will save. The promise that Jesus will save. I'm sure most of you saw the news story just last week that Charles Manson died in a prison hospital at the age of 83. Did you see that story? I have a feeling this might be the first ever Advent sermon that mentions Charles Manson in it. But he was one of the more infamous um, and evil criminals in American history. No need to rehash his sordid story here, but I do want to talk about someone else. Do you know the story of Charles Tex Watson? Interesting story. Charles Watson was 23 years old, a college dropout, and a member of the Manson family. He participated in the 1969 murders of at least seven people, was convicted, and sentenced to death. That sentence was eventually commuted to life sentence because California eliminated the death penalty. And you would think that would be the end of the sad, drug-addled, and violent life of Charles Watson. But it's not. Charles Watson eventually heard the gospel in prison, surrendered his life to Christ in 1975, and for the last 42 years has led a prison ministry called Abounding in Love. He eventually wrote a book entitled Will You Die for Me?, which is a personal testimony of how Jesus transformed his life. Watson became an ordained minister in 1981 and today serves as a pastor in prison. Now, you can check out his website, Abounding in Love. You can find it on the internet. He accepts complete responsibility for his crimes and for the punishment the state of California levied on his life. He's been denied parole 17 times, the last time in 2016, and will likely die in prison. In his own words, he writes, My identity has shifted from that of a murderer to a child of God. I no longer allow my crimes to identify who I am. I see myself as God sees me, a new creation in Christ. Now, obviously, I don't know Charles Watson. I know many people are skeptical, skeptical about murderers who find religion in prison. But I do know the Bible has the promise of a Savior. Verse 21, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus in our English tongue comes from Yeshua in the Hebrew, which means God saves. Now, it doesn't take a theologian or a social scientist to look around at the world around us and know sort of instinctively that something is wrong with the world. Something is terribly broken. From the explosion of sexual assault accusations in our culture, every day, another one, every day, to the mass shootings. Did you know there have been 20 mass shootings, a mass shooting defined as four people wounded in one shooting, been 20 of those since Las Vegas in America? The threat of, of terrorism just three days ago in Egypt, 305 people killed in a mosque trying to worship, the trafficking of children for illicit purposes. Something is wrong. Something's terribly broken. And in the face of all of this, the prevailing secular religion of our culture is that we need more laws. We need better laws. We need better government. We need better education. We need more tolerance. Pastor Tim Keller from New York City writes, years ago I saw an ad in the New York Times, quote, the meaning of Christmas is that love will triumph and we will be able to put together a world of unity and peace, unquote. In other words, we can overcome injustice. We can overcome evil and violence. And we just work together to create a world of unity and peace. That sounds good. But is it really so? Is that true? What if we turn our eyes instead from the world around us to the world within us? If we do that, we see something's broken there, too. We see things like pride and greed and envy and lust, regret, remorse, guilt, words spoken, words left unspoken, relationships broken, strain filled with anger and pain. Hear this. The message of Christmas is not we can make the world a better place if we just try a little harder. It's not the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is in the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The birth of Christ means that we are so lost. Humanity is so broken, so unable to save ourselves that nothing short of the death of God himself could redeem us and save us. That's the promise. 
that Jesus will save. And that promise matters because sin matters. It's real. We know what it is and it destroys. The Apostle Paul speaks for all of us in Romans chapter 7 when he writes, For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do as I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I do not do, not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do not do what I want, it is sin that dwells within me. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? God promises a son. And then he promises that that son will save his people from their sin. That's what the story is about. But there's a third promise in the story, and that's the promise of Emmanuel. The promise of Emmanuel. Pick it up in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took his wife. But he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. I want you to notice here that Matthew is quoting from the Old Testament. In verse 23, it's a direct lift out of Isaiah chapter 7, 14, that says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Now, a little refresher on Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet, what we might call a preacher, living in Jerusalem roughly 700 years before the birth of Christ. And he was prophesying, preaching at a time when the people of Jerusalem were terrified. It was a terrible time for them. Why? Well, because the Assyrians, the great world power under ruthless rulers like Tiglath-Pileser III, He's a real guy, by the way. Look him up in the history books. He was waging war all over that part of the world. He had already sacked the northern kingdom of Israel, and he was on his way south to destroy their entire way of life, their entire religion, and their entire culture. And they knew he was coming, and they couldn't stop him. So they were terrified. So through the prophet Isaiah, God is giving his people a promise. He would not abandon them. God would come to them in the form of Emmanuel. The word in Hebrew means God with us. It was eventually understood to mean the promised Messiah. Now the Jews believed the Messiah was going to be a man who came in the form of King David to rule and lead their people back into prosperity and peace by defeating all their enemies. They're thinking, great, God's going to send us help. He's promised. He's going to be with us. He's going to save us from the Assyrians. But that promise, the promise of Messiah, was not fulfilled right away. Months went by. Years went by. Decades went by. Centuries went by. Here's a question. What happens to a promise when we have to wait? What happens to a promise when we have to wait? After a day, we might get impatient. If you have children, you know what that means. After a week, we might get a little irritated. After a month, we might start to lose hope in whoever gave the promise. After a year, after a decade, how about a century? Maybe God doesn't keep his promises. Maybe God is not able to keep his promises. Maybe there is no God. Some of you may know what that feels like. To pray and pray and pray and wait and wait and wait and hope and you're wondering does God keep his promises and then after 700 years in the most unusual and unexpected way to an unsuspecting man who feels like his world is falling apart there comes a promise the promise of a son one who will save one who is Emmanuel God with us now here's what all this means it means that when Jesus was born God kept a 700-year-old promise. When Jesus was born, God came to us to be with us. He didn't come in blinding glory. He didn't come with overwhelming pomp and power. He came through an unwed teenage mother and a confused adoptive father. He came to a backwater province of the Roman Empire, as far from the seat of political and economic power as you can possibly imagine. God saw the brokenness 
of the world, the same brokenness we see around us every day. And rather than condemn the world, rather than destroy the world, he entered into that world. He entered into all of that world, into its brokenness and violence and evil and pain. And here's the point. If the God of the universe would go that far to come into this world, would he not go that far to come into your world? Into your personal world? See, Jesus is the God who is with us. Jesus is the God who comes. He's the God who comes into the mess and stress of pain of this life. He's the God who comes to where we are, to where we live. My mom and dad were able to visit for just a couple days over Thanksgiving. My mom's 87, my dad's 84. Blessed to still have them around. My father was born in 1933, the youngest of six children in post-depression America. His father died when he was just five years old, leaving almost nothing for a family that struggled to survive. No insurance, no business, no nothing. He remembers very little about that time in his life because it was very, very sad. He does remember that in the summer after his father died, which his father died right about this time in the year, the following summer when school was out, she sent him to live with relatives that lived on a, a country farm a ways away from their home, their home. He now knows she did that so he could make, she could make sure he was fed all summer long because she couldn't take care of all her kids. But he didn't know that then. He was six years old, alone, away from his family, with people he barely knew, doing chores on a farm, terribly lonely. You see, he remembers after finishing his chores every day, he would go out and sit by the country road that ran by this farm. And the reason he did that at six years old, because he knew his older brother, Bill, who was 18 at the time, and was driving a milk truck. And he hoped that maybe his brother would drive by on that road and wave to him. He would feel less alone. He didn't know his brother's milk truck was way, way far, his, his route was way far away. So all summer long, he sat out there, and his brother never drove by. But when my dad was 15, he got invited to a Methodist revival meeting by some buddies on his football team. And that night, Jesus came to him. And if you ask my dad today, he would say from that moment on, he was never alone again. And that's been 70 years. This is where the story begins, the story of with. Because it's the promise of a son. It's the promise of a savior. It's the promise of a God who is with. Who is with us. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, how we thank you today for your word. For your promise. And help us to hear the great story. As if for the first time. Not just with our ears. Not even just with our minds. But with our hearts. And that we we may know you as the God who is with. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you leave the sanctuary today, take time to stop by the kiosk out there, pick up your Together at Christmas magazine, your ornament for your family. We'd love to have you do that as well. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of Jesus, who saves us from our sin and who is Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Amen. Have a great day.